everyone to another battle chat. This is number 15. Hard to believe they're motor along, motoring along at a rate of knots now. Um, and I am extremely pleased today to have managed to persuade someone to come on who I've wanted to have one of these chats with for ages because whenever we do get together in real life, we can't stop rabbiting. Uh, we, we get on really well and we chat about a lot of things. And also, Rich has some really interesting uh, views about the hobby and about wargaming and, you know, w w the, what it means to him and what he thinks defines a, a great war game. Um, so I've kind of given it away there who I've managed to get on the show. And of course, it is Mr. Rich Clark, the other half of Two Fat Lardies. Hello, Rich. Hello, Henry. The better looking half. <laughs> struggling for the... Which will be <laughs> disputed. Well, I think I said that Nick was the handsome half. You you must be the intellectual half. Or was it vice versa? Whatever. It's definitely vice versa on that one. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one with the three degrees. I've got five O-levels. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, anyway, so um, we were just discussing before we came on that we've enjoyed our vegan breakfasts um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's veganry as we record this. And I think Rich and I share our views about the notion of veganry, but that's that's for another time, perhaps. Um, yeah. But obviously, um, Rich is a well-known figure in the hobby and he's been around for a long time. And um, I think... I want to take this opportunity basically to ask the question that, you know, many people always do ask when they meet someone who's kind of you know well known in the hobby is basically, Rich, how did you get started in the hobby? Uh, and, um, you know, what, what, what got you into the hobby and what was its appeal for you? Um, well, essentially, I, um, I come from the generation before political correctness. So my, my grandfather had, uh, uh, was wounded at Passchendaele. My father flew with the RAF in the Second World War. And the default setting with a son was give him a box of toy soldiers. So I really started off with a box of toy soldiers and then collected more boxes of toy soldiers as time went on. It uh, and, and I never stopped, really. I, I started off, um, uh, I suppose, chewing the toy soldiers and ended <laughs> up rolling marbles at them. Uh, and then... Um, uh, blew them up with fireworks as you go through that particular stage, not that you're, you would allow your children to do that these <laughs> days, um, and then got to the point where when I went to big school, I picked up a book in the library, War Games Campaigns by Donald Featherstone, and the rest, as they say, uh, is history. Um, so I realised then that you could actually fight battles with toy soldiers rather than chewing them, blowing them up and uh, throwing marbles at them. And they la consequently lasted a lot longer. Um, <laughs> and, that, and at that point you think, oh, maybe I will put some paint on them, as, as this strange Featherstone man was clearly doing, although uh, all the paint seemed to be in black and white in those days. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, 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 I started... Um, I started wargaming at the point, at the very moment I put down playing with toy soldiers as a, a childish pastime. Although, actually, funnily enough, my uh, my parents were horrified by my hobby. They were they were horrified that I was still playing with toy soldiers Seriously? at eleven, and at twelve and thirteen, it became even worse, more and more. <laughs> so it was a tough it was a tough um, hobby to to do at the time because it really incited so much displeasure but I I simply ignored them and cracked on with it and um and got to the point when I was 18 I, I had my I got my first mortgage got my first property and then all of a sudden I was free to do with what, whatever I wanted without any parental disapproval whatsoever and that was the point where my wargaming really took off I found a local club in St Albans mm. met other people because prior to that it had always been um, one of those things you did quietly and discreetly in your own bedroom yeah. um, uh, because uh, it wasn't something you'd talk about in public. And and to a degree, that was down to my parents saying, good Lord, don't tell people you're playing with toy soldiers. But also because, you know, there were girls out there and you <laughs> didn't want the mates laughing at you in front of girls. So, uh, But once I uh, achieved majority, so to speak, I thought, sod it, I'm just going to go out there and have fun with my toy soldiers. And... and uh, Having found a local club, I never looked back. So that's really interesting. That um, didn't you have? Wasn't there a war games club or anything of the kind at school where you were? 
Uh, yeah, there was, but I was far too cool to go to that because ah. um, I, I was I was more sort of rugby and stuff like that. I mean, we didn't have girls at my school, um, so I didn't have to worry about that. But there was definitely a peer group pressure going on. And to, to be honest, I think the War Games Club started while I was in the fifth form. And at that age, you are at your least likely to uh, start yeah, yeah. Pr- uh, parading around with toy soldiers. Um, so no, uh, I, I was very much a solo gamer up to the up to the point where I found the local war games club, which I think I must have been nineteen because it was in nineteen eighty three, um, and uh, I saw an advert in military modelling because there were no war games magazines at that point in time. Battle for war gamers had shut down, mm. and there were a couple of guys there saying we're setting up a war games club. And so we went along, we met in somebody's attic for the first couple of weeks. Then his wife said, for God's sake, get these weirdos out of my house. (laughs) And uh, uh, we found a room in a local pub, at which point it became even more attractive because it combined my two great loves in life, (laughs) beer and toy soldiers. Um, And, uh, uh, yeah, and and it it was kind of a, a, a fabulous exposure to... The, a hobby that I had envisaged very much in the in the mould of Featherstone and Bath and Terry Wise, yeah. because obviously Airfix guides were um, the rule sets that were most prevalent in the, the, those times. Yeah. And I discovered a club full of absolute free thinkers. It was um, uh, they were playing games with variable length bounds, and they were converting figures. There was a guy there called Will McNally who uh, is uh, up in Wrexham these days. I still see him at the shows. He always comes and says hello. But he was producing, uh, he'd he'd converted some uh, Airfix Japanese into Ascari. Um, Or so he claimed. Frankly, they looked like Airfix Japanese. But (laughs) in our game, they were Ascaris. And we were fighting in East Africa with um, we were fighting in East Africa in the First World War using homegrown rules that he produced, and the the whole atmosphere of the club was very much a hot house of people developing ideas. We were doing back to back. There was a, there was a board game out at the time called Cry Havoc, which yeah. was um, cardboard medieval knights and stuff like that. Yeah. And we'd do that in a back-to-back setting. So I could see what I knew was going on, but I couldn't see what my opponent could see. Oh, right. And it was um, it was a really freestyle sort of environment. And I then assumed, well, obviously, this is where wargaming has got to. Oh, right. And it completely slipped past me that, you know, the majority of people were playing DBM and tournaments and uh, wargames, WRG 6th edition or whatever edition, because yeah. we didn't do anything like that. Right. Um, so, uh, and it was really a case of writing your own rules. So I would write uh, a set of medieval rules. I wrote a set of rules for counterinsurgency uh, warfare. Um, uh, I, I wrote um, uh, rules for um, uh, the Franco-Prussian War, which at the time was just well, kind of invisible, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but people would take airfix figures, hack them about, and all of a sudden claim they were something quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think la- largely, uh, that was, uh, the conversion was more a case of what colour paint you painted things rather than anything else. But nevertheless, it, it you know, it did for us, and it allowed us to, uh, allowed us to play all sorts of different games that, uh, that we, I think, were probably fairly unique in doing in that respect. We yeah. just, I didn't realise it at the time. Yeah, I mean that's that is really interesting that you took this very quite very different route into the hobby to me certainly f- during your teens by the sound of things. I think we started yeah. off the same way, you know, dad buying toy yeah. soldiers and stuff and that persisting. Uh, I didn't have the I didn't have the parental confrontation that it sounds like you did. I mean, my um oh. obviously because my dad died quite young and he right. I think would have still have loved it, the fact that I was playing with the toy soldiers that he Yeah, yeah. Made. And mum was very accommodating, bless her heart. Um, but also, you know, I did, I suppose I did, um, 
I started solo like everything else, but soon, I don't know why, I managed to find other kids who were really interested in what I was doing. And then at school, when I got to school, already there was a kind of a, um, a nascent war games club going, which, which mushroomed during my time at school. And this would have been in the early mid 70s, you know. Um, and it was quite interesting, but I, it, I was brought up playing all those conventional rule sets that you mentioned there that you weren't brought up playing you know so yeah. I, I was playing the newbury rules i was playing the bruce quarries i was playing the wrgs and that kind of thing so it's, yeah. I, it's fascinating to me that you you didn't go through that process and you were kind of dropped in the deep end in what seems like it sounds like a really creative environment up there it was something. i mean f funnily enough the only real commercial game that we played was dungeons and dragons right um and that very much suited the style of make it up as, as you go along i mean i even experimented with doing games when i was about 20 doing games with no rules where i would simply hold a clipboard and somebody would say, I'm firing this unit at that. I'd look studiously at the clipboard and say, roll me 2d6. Uh, roll, roll me a d6. If they rolled a zero, a, a one, it was no effect. If they rolled a two, three, four, or five, they got one hit. If they rolled a six, they got two hits. And you can, and I still use that, some, that sometimes when I was I'm running say. Speeds. Because it's it's a simple little rule, and, and, and it... And funnily enough, because I had a clipboard, everybody assumed I had my, you know, my home developed set of rules on there, and never <laughs> actually, never actually asked any questions. And we just ended up playing this, playing this game, which was based entirely. Well, it's a, in modern terms, we'd call it a free Kriegspiel, yeah, yeah. which was purely based on the judgment. The results were purely based on the judgment of the umpire, yeah. which was a bit arrogant, really, at twenty years old, with really. You know, not a huge amount of knowledge, but at the time it seemed like a good idea, yeah. and I got away with it because nobody realised. But yeah, I mean, so, so something like D and D, um, which we didn't play a vast amount of, but that very much fitted in with the type of atmosphere because it was it allowed you to be creative, create your own environments, cre react to what was happening, and develop that that situation just on the hoof but trying to make it plausible. And uh, that, that, that was an interesting experience. Yeah, I was going to say that, that what you were doing sounds remarkably like the kind of that 1970s time when Dungeons and Dragons was pretty much free Kriegspiel. You know, all, yeah, yeah. all the rule books and the Dungeon Master's Guides and all the rest of it came along in due course. But most people could most people could probably only afford the basic rule book. And so the Dungeon Master pretty much made it, you know, made it, it might, yeah. wouldn't be using D6. You'd be using percentage dice probably, but you'd just yeah, say, yeah, oh, yeah. God, that... That sounds yeah. like a really difficult thing to do to climb that slimy cliff face. So you better yeah. roll ninety percent plus on the on the the, the percentage dice. Yeah, uh, that, that's exactly right. And it wasn't it wasn't a D and D. It wasn't advanced D and D. It was just the basic Dungeons and Dragons set. And um, uh, in fact, when they went to advanced Dungeons and Dragons, I thought, well, why why all these rules? We 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 make this up. There's no need for this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. I that, I mean at that. that that point, I, I kind of found myself going more towards, you know, only historical gaming based on historical stuff and, and left that bit behind. Um, but also because I, a mate of mine, uh, I, I actually uh, actually left the club for a couple of years because, uh, well, three years because I had a pub in North London. I was a publican. And it was one of those things where I had to put everything I had in storage, let my, let, let my flat out and go and live in the pub and do that and uh, the guy who put the uh, who had my dungeons and dragons collection lost it or has still got it or i never saw it again oh or i never saw him again or something like that so that kind of was the end of that but it it also the timing was right because i thought i don't need all this advanced stuff it's just not really not necessary we can yeah. we can do that ourselves yeah absolutely so that's a really interesting bit of background there, Rich. Absolutely fascinating. So already, at you know, in your late teens, early twenties, you've got the rule writing bug, and yeah. and and as well as that, as I've I've kind of made a note here that of course the other thing that people mustn't forget is you've been writing articles for magazines for donkey's years as well. I mean, I seem to remember, certainly remember you appearing in Duncan McFarlane's early miniature war games, didn't you? Um, uh, 
No, War Games Illustrated. Oh, the early uh, War Games Illustrated. War Games Illustrated, yeah, yeah. So we're going back to, I don't know, late 80s. Right, so uh, 86, 87, that kind of time. Yeah. Uh, it's... Um, yeah, uh, it's funny how the hobby has changed, and in some ways you have parallels with today. I mean, I've always enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing at school, you mm. know, creative writing. And actually, my column in uh, War Games Soldiers and Strategy is one of the most enjoyable things I do. I mean, I must admit, sometimes, yes, a guy will say, your, your column's due, and I'll go, I don't know, what am I going to write about? And he'll go, I, I don't know, I'll ask you. And yet... Funnily enough, the, la the last column was on battlefield uh, walking. Yeah. And uh, Gasper said to me, why don't you do it on battlefield walking? Well, the reason he said that was he and I had met up at Arnhem yeah. the previous month. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, it's obvious really, isn't it? But <laughs> normally I've got so much stuff clogging up my brain that yeah. I, I need somebody to probably in the right direction sometimes. But I really do enjoy that because I'm not, I'm not writing – as as Richard from Two Fat Lardies, I'm just writing as Richard the Wargamer, yeah. and it's quite nice to have that freedom to address issues that are not about the business and just talk about my love of things I do in the hobby. So that that's always fun. But um, I think in the old days, in inverted commas, yeah. um, writing was very much about sharing information as much yeah, as anything yeah. else. You know, we would be doing games um about let's say the franco-prussian war or maximilian in mexico or the russian civil war and if i'd got books on that to research it these books were almost impossible for other people to get i mean i can remember when i researched the russian civil war i was paying literally hundreds and hundreds of pounds for some very rare books that you know your average punter wouldn't have had access to, and uh, and so I would then write these articles in order to share information and get interest going in the hobby. Yeah. Um, of course, these books are now available for free online, and I'm left with a load of fairly useless, <laughs> what antiquarian books in which I only really wanted the information. I didn't want the antique book, yeah, yeah. but it, it's it's that sense of the collective in the hobby. That where people have always worked together. In the earliest days, it would be people writing into Battle for Wargamers saying, what colour are the socks of a Grenadier Guardsman? Yeah. And, and and people would then write in and say they're red, white, sky blue, pink or whatever. Yeah. But it's that collectiveness of the hobby that I've always felt has been something that's been positive. And when I found out information, mm. it was you almost felt an obligation to let other people in the hobby know because yeah. you were excited about doing a new period. You had information that other people didn't, and it was just great to put pen to paper to make that available. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that we've tried to replicate with the Lard community is that collectiveness whereby – you know, we all work for the collective good of, of all of all the other people out there playing our games. You know, we try and help them answering questions, but we also um, try to encourage them by making things available. Like there's a lot of guys making pint-sized campaigns available, mm. a lot of guys making army lists available. And it's the collective effort that can achieve so much more than the individual. So yeah. I think that ethos that was there in the old days, the way we actually carried that through was by writing magazine articles. Now we we do it by sharing that information on blogs or yeah. um, whatever, web pages, yeah. uh, uh, um, podcasts like this. Mm. Um, and that, that, but that collective aspect is still there and strong in the hobby. And yeah. I think that's something that's really positive. Yeah, I would. <clears throat> I completely agree about that, and and I suppose I was always brought up, you know, think back to the old days that that BBC, uh, the original BBC kind of uh, motto. That uh, I think the guy's name was Reith, wasn't it? This Reith yeah. idea of um, exactly what you say there. Pass it. You, you. What good is knowledge if you don't pass it on? Yeah, exactly. and, and and it's also having that kind of personality where if you discover something, you're not like Gollum or oh, my precious, keep it to myself. <laughs> the whole point is I've found this information. I want to share it with the world. Isn't that amazing? And that's not my <laughs> attitude. Nick is more like Gollum. <laughs> That's just, and I can say that because he's not here. That's just that's just in terms of his looks, though, Rich. Be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart, Nick. We... Precious. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Hello, Mick. We know you're listening. Uh, but but yeah, that I think that is a really important point because certainly, um, you know, having been around uh, during this period where the internet has has come into mm. being and and blossomed, you know, I, back in as I was saying to um, Phil. Phil Dutre, of course, that's right. Phil Dutre, yeah. I, I really enjoyed that, by the way. I thought it was excellent. It was really interesting what Phil had to say, but carry on. Sorry. He's a very interesting guy. But, yeah, mm. we were remembering that, you know, we have set up our websites back in 95, 96, 97, yeah. 98, when the internet didn't exist, and you launched a website just to see how it worked, really. And, and then when yeah. people arrived and said that they were interested in what you were doing, that was a miracle. It's like, oh, my God. You know, I can remember some of the first people who, who contacted me via back games we're in bloody latvia and lithuania and portugal <laughs> and spain you know america which was seemed miraculous to me and and but what it revealed was that certainly in that period um I think that the magazines had kind of blossomed and were really kind of extremely popular in the 1970s, 80s. And in the 90s, things kind of died down a bit. And of course, we lost Practical War Game, as Stuart Asquith's Practical War yeah. Game, didn't we, in the early 90s. And a lot of people, including me, of course, were sitting around thinking, well, surely someone's going to pick up that baton and run with it. And no one did. So then when the internet appeared, suddenly, as you say, it became this alternative online venue to magazines where you had the benefit of immediate responses you know you'd, you'd put a thing up somewhere saying oh you know what were the color of the french grenadier guards socks and you'd get an answer back within a day certainly often within oh, yeah. minutes quite extraordinary yeah. and i think yeah. that that's one of the things that has helped to secure and propel forward the hobby certainly over the last kind of decade or so um you know which i'm delighted to have been a part of and and, and you as well because mm, you know mm. one of the things we're going to be talking about later today is you are now can produce digital product for people which they can yeah. buy and be reading within minutes you know they're not having to wait for the postman and that mm, mm, both mm. as a consumer and as a business person is an extraordinary thing uh i mean i can remember when i first sold my, my first digital copies of battle games it was like oh my god this is an amazing thing and people were emailing back the same day saying god i've already read that issue henry you know that's i really enjoyed that issue or or could you put me in touch with this is the other great thing could you put me in touch with the guy who wrote that article you know yeah. some extraordinary opportunities but anyway that so we're going to be talking some more about you know internet and digital products and stuff a bit later mm. but so what i'm interested in as well and i think a lot of people are you know nick was telling us what he feels were kind of his babies of the lardy stable what what bits of the lardy stable do you look at and say yes that's definitely was primarily my baby and i and i'm kind of most proud of that okay um well, I think uh, it's important to put the caveat first, which is that Nick and I work together on all our rule sets very, very closely. What sure. normally happens, though, is one of us will get the inspiration because, you know, we've read a book or we've, you know, seen a film or whatever, and we think, oh, I fancy having a go at that. And then the other the other party is always there as a sounding board and, and there to play test and so on and so forth but as uh, as you rightly say there are some projects which are mine and there are some that are his i mean for example bag the hum is very definitely his um he he was um uh, very interested in aerial warfare um my father was a pilot in world war ii and i very definitely was not interested in aerial warfare having <laughs> been dragged around hendon aircraft museum almost every weekend as a small <laughs> child i was sick of the sight of bloody things and so that was definitely his my main ones have been um uh, oh chain of command sharp practice uh daps britanniarum and uh through the mud and the blood uh i guess would be the big ones i mean there are uh, there will be some others that I've forgotten, but they they would be the the ones that have really got my fingerprints all over it. Um, pride, I don't know, and I don't really do pride, but I mean, chain of command. What I like about chain of the command the command is people will you, you go online and you, you you go on places like TMP and people will say there's nothing new under the sun. There's no new rules concepts. Everybody's just rehashing what's been out there previously, and I think actually no. 
Um, Chain of Command has some ideas in there, such as the patrol phase, which which I think are completely unique and I don't think I've ever seen used anywhere else. Uh, and I think they work. So it's lovely to be able to think you have actually made some kind of contribution mm. to the body of knowledge, so to speak. Um, sharp practice. Uh, what I kind of like about that is it was the first game of large skirmish size, yeah. which then yeah. has been replicated by so many other games of a similar size like Saga or whatever. Prior to Sharp Practice First Edition, if you wanted to play Napoleonics, you'd either play big battles like mm. General Dame, you know, something by Dave Brown, mm. um, or Black Powder now, um, or you would play uh, a skirmish game that was incredibly detailed with maybe half a dozen figures, which maybe you were just responsible for one figure. Yeah. And when the bloke when the bloke had scratched his ear, that would be his turn. Yeah. Um, and and that had no real appeal to me because it was too much micromanagement. I wanted something in the middle. So in a way, the fact that Sharp Practice was the first of those large skirmish games was interesting. Mud and Blood. I think Mud and Blood, through the Mud and the Blood, our World War One skirmish set made World War Two playable. And but maybe I'm more proud of that than anything else because it was the product of the revisionist history movement mm -hmm. that was there to counter that World War One is a sausage sausage machine. Mm -hmm. And you know, realistically, World War One saw it was a period of intense um, development mm -hmm. and change, and it was. The second half of World War One saw the birthplace of modern infantry tactics, mm. and to make that playable and make that attractive to people, I think, has has actually opened up um, an alternative view of history, and the rules have complemented and encouraged people to the rules have encouraged people to read more about the history and complement the, the the modern historians views of what actually happened and so in a way it's that combination of probably a bit surprising that it's through the mud and the blood which is you know one of our much one of our more historical and lesser known rule sets but probably as as doing a job of connecting history with wargaming that's mm. That's probably the one that's the, the best bridge between the two. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's interesting because I think um, you're right. I mean, the, the way you talk about those various rule sets is also how I read them. I think that the chain of command it has a fascination as much to do with the game mechanisms as anything else, that there is a, there's innovation. There's clearly innovation happening in that rule set. Through the mud and the blood, though, because I can remember you wrote an article for me in Battle Games back right. when that first came out, didn't you? And yeah. uh, I, I remember us talking about that because, you know, my grandfather as well, well, he was heavily wounded at Luce in um, 1915. Um, and um, I think... In a sense, I, I had to, what Through the Mother and Blood did to me and what you wrote about at that time made me realise a lot about my own thinking about World War One, uh, that probably I hadn't. Well, I just hadn't read the right books, I suppose. I'd, I'd, I'd read a lot about World War One going mm. back a long time, but I hadn't read it very much recently. I certainly hadn't read much of the revisionism. And mm. I had a kind of ex swallowed hook like line and sinker, the kind of uh, lions led by donkeys kind of view of mm. World War One, which, of course, is, uh, you know... <laughs> It's just a gross overgeneralization. Certainly, there were instances. Yeah, it is. Where yeah, it there is. Was and, a waste of life. But, yeah, and it's interesting that when we talk about revisionist World War One historians, we, the revisionists actually turned up in the 1950s and 60s with mm. the anti-war movement that was associated with Vietnam and yeah. so on and so forth, and they were the ones. Uh, who portrayed this um, merciless sausage machine just destroying life. When, in fact, you know, you, when, when Haig died, he was not reviled as a monster. Yeah. Uh, millions of people walked past his coffin as yeah. a sign of respect. Yeah. The revisionism happened not uh, not at the time, but, but since then. And, of course, when we were at school, what we were taught about the First World War probably came from uh, English teachers reading poetry rather yeah. than from history teachers teaching us the historical side of things. Yeah. And poets are of a certain mentality. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really good point that actually we received much of our thinking about World War One from artists and poets rather yeah. than from historians. But also, I think it's because uh, probably people were looking at the Great War on the wrong level. People were looking at it on this kind of mass effect of, oh, my God, yes, millions of people were dying. That That's undeniable. But what that <laughs> overlooked was their literally at ground level, the innovation that was taking place in small <laughs> unit tactics and yeah. arms and, you know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's, you know, if you're looking at kind of the, the babies that you're most proud of, I would certainly say you're absolutely justified of being proud of through the mud and the blood. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, though. I'll tell you what I am proud of. Um, it's not so much the rule set. It's the community, the Lardy community that's grown up and the Games Day concept. Yes, um, yes, yes. That's yes. ancillary. But it's very much emphasising the social aspects of the hobby. Historically, when, when gamers used to get together to play games, it tended to be in a competitive environment. I'm talking about gamers who don't, didn't know each other, who would go along to an event and attend. Mm. They'd take 1,500-point army along and they would fight battles against people who they've never met before. Mm. With the Lardy days that we've got, the emphasis is not on um, competitive winning at all costs. The emphasis is on building friendships mm. through shared gaming experiences. Mm. And I am really proud of that. I and mean, we've got a number of established Lardy Games Day, but we've got a new one happening this year down in Southampton. Uh, uh, the guy who's running it, Mark Backhouse, who writes for WSS, yep. he said, I would like to do a Lardy Day. Would you? Could you come along? I said, of course, because obviously... As part of the whole community emphasis we have, mm. we want to make ourselves available. He advertised that. I think within 24 hours, he sold out about 60 tickets, and he's got a waiting list there of people looking to attend. Now, this is not an event with a with a, a history of you know having been done half a dozen times. Yeah. This is a first time event, and and when you see that people are really keen to get involved with that sense of social non-competitive, I mean competitive obviously, because we all like to win a game, but competitive within the bounds of enjoying a day of gaming yeah. with like-minded people and, and you know making new friends, going for that curry at the end and having a couple of beers at the end. That is that community that has grown up around two fat lardies is something I am really proud of because and, it's and it's unique, Rich. I mean I I don't think any other uh, rules manufacture. I mean, I know. Let, let, okay, we mentioned Warlord Games. They put on their Warlord Games Day, but that's kind of an annual thing, and it's and it's quite a different, quite a different sort of feel. I think, because, and we're going to talk about this as well later. I think that one of the tricks that you and Nick have managed to pull off is to become a hugely successful commercial enterprise without seeming like a hugely successful commercial enterprise. If you see yeah, that, that has, um, yeah, that has positives and negatives. But yes, I yeah. think we certainly uh, yeah. certainly like to keep it real. And, you know, there's no ivory towers on Blard Eye. And also the other thing is uh, that I forgot to put in a show notes, actually, you, you know, I think one of the great things uh, about you uh, as being probably the, the better known half of Two Fat Lardies is that I pretty much everyone acknowledges that you are a great showman, Rich, that you can be found at shows up and down the land and, you know, overseas as well, flying, I think, not just <coughs> flying the Lardy flag, but flying the wargaming enthusiast flag. Uh, mm. And I think that that's one of the reasons why you gain such huge respect is that you have an obvious love and passion for the hobby, which you're <coughs> almost desperate to communicate to the point where you'll do a day long show and you hardly be able to speak at the end of it because you'll have lost your voice. Yeah, yeah. And you know, most recently of course yeah. you've I mean you've you've just been given um uh various awards by War Games Illustrator. I think you picked up uh, three of them, didn't you, for best this, best that and best the other. What a tank yeah, yeah. Uh, chain of command and best customer service or bronze in best yeah. customer service. Yeah. But sure. also at uh Crisis in Antwerp back in November you won best game I I, I have to say again and I think a lot of that uh, is very much down to you 
being the showman. So, of course, what people want to know is, is that something that comes naturally to you or is it something that you've had to work at? Is it something you actually enjoy or is it something that you feel you have to do and it just leaves you exhausted and enervated at the end of it? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I've, I think um, enthusiasm uh, for the hobby um, has allowed me to develop, and the fact that I do it regularly has allowed me to develop a certain style, um, which um, which isn't which isn't made up. Uh, it, it's it is it's definitely me. Yeah. Um, but I think the way it's important when you are running a game at a show mm. to recognise the fact that the people who are at the show have paid to get through the door. Some of them might be taking part in your game, but there are also others there who are watching your game, and they play just as much to get through the door and are probably just as interested as the people who are playing it. I know many, many people, and I see them regularly at shows, who will come along and watch a game to get an idea of how rules work. Yeah. And so what I try and do when I am presenting a game at a show is I try and keep the people on the table involved, obviously, to tell them what's going on. But I will often address the advice that I'm giving them to the crowd. So I'll go, Fred, you've rolled this on your command dice. Now, remember, a one can allow you to do this, a two yeah. to do this. So in this situation, you could do that and that and that, or you could change that and you could use add that two and that one up and you could do this and this and this. Yeah. And I'm addressing the crowd and I'm talking to them the crowd yeah. um it's probably so that i think makes it more of a holistic experience for people um you know for everybody who's there they feel like they're taking part in the game whether they're actually playing it or not mm. um i think there are aspects of my personality which is i like a laugh and therefore if i don't take myself too seriously in fact mm. i don't take myself very seriously at all <laughs> so i will i will put in asides and jokes one of the things that i love in life are double entendres <laughs> which really? comes from a not you, spotted, <laughs> really. i feel like that comes with shock um, so some of the double entendres i chuck in the past they're perfectly innocent in what they say can be relatively near the knuckle. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, for the most part, if there are any kids there, they don't catch the jokes, because it's a bit like going to pantomime. Yeah, a lot yeah. of the jokes are in there for the adults. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of the people enjoy that, and I do that just because that's in my nature. So, and I think that combination of me liking to have a laugh with me trying very hard to be make the game an inclusive experience... Yeah. Is, is something that works for us. Um, I'm sure other people. I'm not. I'm not claiming that there's anything unique about me. I mean, I I am not Britain's funniest comedian. I will not be applying for Britain's Got Talent <laughs> or anything like that. But um, you know, I'm I'm prepared to uh, I'm prepared to chuck in a few jokes to make it more interesting for everybody. And and because really, because it makes it more interesting for me. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So that combination of working hard at it and also having a laugh, I think, is a, is a bit of a winning combination for us. It's interesting, actually. You go to a lot of shows, and um, I did some research on this about um, oh, eight, nine, ten years ago because um, we uh, used to take games along to shows, and we never used to win any prizes for anything we'd done. Oh. And yet we used to be there with our table completely surrounded by hordes, hordes of people. Mm. So I <coughs> contacted a lot of show organisers and said, I'm just doing some research into the hobby. I'm wondering if you can tell me what criteria you use to judge best uh, participation game and best demonstration game. Mm. And often it came back that it was exactly the same. It was the yeah. quality of the terrain, how pretty the figures were, are there any handouts, and um, was there any signage on the table explaining what the, what the game was? And you think, well, maybe that works for a demonstration game, mm. but but equally, there's, surely there should be more. Even if you're doing a demonstration game, you should be engaging with the people who are at that show yeah. to uh, allow them to feel that they got some involvement. Nick and I, I'll never forget, we were at Colours one year, and some guys were doing a fabulous game based on the eagle that's landed. 
Oh, yeah. And they rebuilt the whole village and they had the water mill there and all that. Yeah. And Nick went up to the guy and he said, which one of these is J.R. Ewing? Because J.R. Ewing played That's the right. Officer. Yeah, yeah. He said, do you mind? We're trying to play a war game here. What? Uh, yeah. So I told him in a relatively small number of words, too, <laughs> what I thought of their game. Uh, or what I thought of him, and it was it was just so stupid. I thought I never want to be in a position where I'm doing that. So yeah. I I have always thought, well, I'm not I'm not I don't do it to win trophies at shows. What I try and do is do it to get people to have a good time and to allow me to have a good time. Yeah. So it's um, I can't even remember what the question is, but that is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, but it's interesting what you mentioned about the judging criteria there, because um, I've been asked um, a couple of times now, bless their hearts, by Trix and Lawrence, who run Partisan, to be a yeah. judge at Partisan. And that's uh, you make a really interesting point. Now, when it comes to demo games, you've mm. described pretty much what makes a good demo game. Plus, yeah. in my case, if I see backs turn to the audience, I yeah, just yeah. walk on by. I'm not interested. Yeah. When it comes to participation game, I mean, I engage another sense, the sense of hearing, because you can hear a good participation game, which is often why you get awarded them, Rich, because you can hear the laughter. You can hear the shouts of excitement and engagement. It, 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 it sounds a good participation game. You can't ignore it. It's in a good participation game is always in danger of disturbing the other games around it, <laughs> in a sense. Because Yeah, well, I think you're probably right, because certainly the experience that I have when I'm running those games is that you are in a bubble. The only thing you're aware of is your table yeah. and what's happening on it. Uh, and and the, the the faces immediately around it, and so you 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 really have got no idea what else is going on at the show. Absolutely. And I think it probably helps in view of your criteria the fact I've got a big voice, a big voice which carries fairly well. Yeah, you know. So, I understand. But I mean, there are a few. Perhaps I just get a prize for the biggest gob. <laughs> We could always do that. But, I mean, there are, <laughs> over the years, I've noticed you, there are a few clubs who've made a really good fist of putting on participation games. I mean, a few years ago at Partisan, I don't know if you remember, there was the, the RAF guys who regularly attend the shows, and they put on a brilliant Minions game for kids. And uh, the yeah, kids I, did, I, I saw photographs of it afterwards. Right. But yeah, what a great idea. Absolutely. Great. First of all, a great idea. It looked great. I mean, it didn't look like a conventional war game for sure, but it looked great. But it was the engagement they got with those kids, which yeah. was fantastic. You know, kids who've just been walk going around the show, dragged around the show by mum because dad was off bu buying stuff. And suddenly yeah. there's this game that was at their eye level and which engaged them. And the guys running the game, they, maybe they're all parents and were really good at Hand, you know dealing with kids but yeah, they yeah. Would, it was just fantastic and the laughter and excitement you know it just made it stand out and uh, and there is this you know i mean your games your participation games always happen to look good as well i mean i think back a few years to where for example some of the um, sharp practice games that you put on mm. some of those look stunning with beautiful model ships and all the rest of it and, and now mm. that can help but the look of the game isn't the be all and end all when it comes to the participation game the key is in you know the, the clues in the bloody question it's a participation yeah. game and yeah. therefore if you're attracting lots of people and they want to engage they want to participate even if that happens to also be promoting what is also a commercial rule set that yeah. doesn't matter that doesn't matter so you know hats off to you mate um you know i i, I think i'm going to send you a bottle of throat tonic for your next one so, <laughs> just be kind of... I, I, I lubricate it after most shows but not with throat <laughs> tonic. it's the we... cooking lager that uh yeah that, see that cures all remedial <laughs> cooking lager uh just as a kind of it's a little aside really one of the other things that i've always noticed is uh in the lardy rule sets the illustrations and it turns out basically you are the two fat lardy's illustrator rich now this oh. is a, a talent that you don't you don't ever 
kind of talk about or promote, but it's obviously a useful talent and something I assume that you enjoy doing. It, it, is that something, are you self-taught? Did you study art at school or, you know, how's that come about? Well, I did art O level. I got a B, Henry, which um, yeah. doesn't necessarily suggest that I'll be doing the Sistine Chapel anytime <laughs> soon. Um, but uh, I, I, um, I can't stand. Uh, uh, I, I don't really like doing it. Um, I'm not very good at it. I can just about. I could a few years just about ago just about get away with it with some of the black and white line drawings. Um, uh, but it's one of those things. It's, I do a lot of articles on on making terrain yeah. um, on on the on Wild Island News, generally because I just like sharing ideas with people again about what I'm doing with that. And I'm not very good at that, but it's just a case of sometimes just a case of having the balls to just do it. Um, and with the artwork, it was very much it was very much that we we wanted some pictures, and I can draw a bit. And so I drew up a few pictures, and some of them I'm not overly pleased with, and some of them just about past muster. But no, I mean, I, I didn't study that or, or do anything more than uh, um, buy myself a set of decent mapping pens. Um, once you've got a set of decent pens with variable size nibs and you use the right one for the right task, it tends to make it a bit easier, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, it's, so it's 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 just I've, I've always been able to I've always been able to draw a bit. It's not something I've ever really enjoyed, and it's not something I would hope to ever do again. All right, because no, it's I mean for uh, a lot of the stuff I've that I've seen you do reminds me very much of those Commando comics from back in the kind of nineteen sixties seventies. You know your your illustrations for Bag the Han, the cover yeah. of Chain yeah. of Command, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, is that something that you kind of copied as a, as a kid because i know that there were certain things that i i saw drawings or paintings or something and i would just literally try to copy it you know that's how i did a lot of my my own learning is that something you yeah. did yeah yeah um yes very much so i mean all the, the cover of chain of command actually was uh, a, an image commissioned by dr gobles um uh, it, it just nicked it off a a, a, a poster from oh, the really? period and then ended it well i presumed on the basis that dr gobles was unlikely to pursue me for a copyright <laughs> uh, that i could actually nick it so i did but uh, you know the bag the ham stuff i did draw yeah and, and the mother and the blood stuff yeah, yeah. but uh, i um yeah no it's it's not something I enjoy enjoy doing, but it, it can be useful sometimes. If you like the two fat lardies pie and a pint logo, I drew yeah. that in a pub. Yeah. We said when we first discussed the name, and I just scribbled it up. And whilst it's rough and ready, and was scribbled on a napkin, I quite like it because it sums us up. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. tall, full of beer. He's short and full of pies. <laughs> Because the other thing is, as um, I kind of mentioned with Nick, that you uh, have really taken to uh, using kind of Adobe design software and doing your own layouts and that kind of stuff. Because I remember yeah. giving you, I gave you a couple of tutorials yeah. a couple of years ago, whenever it was. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that, you know, as as someone who teaches something, I always I love it when someone takes the information you've given them and then goes off and runs with it, and you can suddenly see, oh my God, Rich has suddenly done all this stuff, which is which is really brilliant. I mean, was that kind of a a breakthrough for you? Oh God, yeah. I mean, we um, decided that um, we had up to a point been doing all our layout in Microsoft, and it, it's just not the right thing. Yeah. Um, and so we decided we were going to go to Max. Uh, and obviously we've got the full Adobe suite as part of a, you know, the software mm -hmm. rental uh, thing that uh, we subscribe to, so we get all these different packages. And I looked at it and I thought, I just have absolutely no idea. And I, we'd had a conversation about, yeah. I'd asked you, what do you think about Max? And you said, yeah, it's really good. And I, <laughs> I just, I phoned you up and said, Henry, can you please just allow, give me a starter lesson? And I came down and uh, we did that. And it was invaluable. I mean, I wouldn't say I left there and knew exactly how to do it. But I did leave there. And even now, I'm finding things that you taught me that I suddenly realize what they were about. And they were <laughs> literally only last week. I thought, oh, yeah, Henry told me about that. But having had that basic 
it's it's like jumping into a swimming pool. Sometimes you can jump into a swimming pool when you can't swim and you immediately start to swim. But sometimes, you know, this swim, the swimming pool that was the full adobe suite was a swimming pool full of sharks. Yeah. And I felt that I needed somebody to at least give me a stick that would be the starting point so I could beat the sharks off. <laughs> and you provided me with that stick in the shape of a, a day or two's training. And that, that did allow me to go in with a bit more confidence that at least I could start something and draw a shape or yeah. whatever. And from there, it's been a case of um, um, being a bit of an autodidact, really, you know, just teach yeah. yourself. Yeah, I mean, and it's brilliant to see because, you know, certainly your layouts and stuff, they're, they're completely professional. I mean, this, you know, I, I look at what you produce and think that's really smart stuff. You know, it's, 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 you know, I couldn't do any better. It's brilliant. You know, so effectively I feel like, oh, shit, I've done myself out of a job there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's part, you know, but I, I do love, as I say, the, the, the teaching someone something, because it's the same when you teach someone how to play a set of war games rules, isn't it? Yeah. And then you see them, putting together their own war game using those rules it's fantastic you know it's, it's a it's yeah. a it's a it's almost kind of a paternal feeling isn't it that you get when you when you pass yeah, it along. and that, now this does tie into something that we mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about which is i'm sure everyone listening to this because initially obviously it's just going to be the patrons and a couple of days later this is going to be open to the wider world and many hundreds of people will be listening to this that hello, hello many hundreds of people um, hello many hundreds of people um perhaps thousands who knows but this everyone has known about two fat lardies as and thought about them for a long time as kind of the underdog uh war games rules produce you know this the, the, these two guys nice guys yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're intelligent they're friendly and probably they're doing it in a shed somewhere and you know yeah they produce a few rule sets and and you know oh gosh you know they 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 they, they often get bullied by these big rules manufacturers or people talk down <laughs> about them you know and it's not and and so we, they've got this nice little community of you know some chums who a few of these people who play these rules and in fact nothing could be further th from the truth because you you've you're running a business that sells tens of thousands of copies of your rule sets every year and it doesn't take an idiot to work out now hang on if they're selling let's say twenty five thousand rule sets at 10 pounds a pop every year oh my god that's a business with a quarter of a million pound turnover now mm. that mm. i can relate to because when i was running my design agency back in the day we had a turnover of between about 250 and 300 thousand pounds you know now yeah. that's a serious bloody business rich and i think that uh, it's important that we get this message across to people. Can you? So I think it's also would be really helpful. Could you sort of take us through the journey that you've taken, not just not as a war gamer now, but as a business? You know, your 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 relationship with Nick, how that's flourished and and created this. What is clearly you know not in the same league as perhaps Games Workshop or maybe not even Warlord Games, but it's a it certainly must be kind of cl third place or close to it in the rankings in in the war games world certainly in the uk so how's that come about nick uh rich uh, sorry i'm calling you nick now aren't I? yeah no no I, I haven't put that much weight on <laughs> um, uh, well the whole thing was a accidental really i mean in the first instance we were just producing rules and sharing them in a way that we shared information mm. um uh, through magazines, but it, I mean, the business, uh, we ended up publishing rules because people said, oh, you really ought to publish these, and it went from there onwards. And I was uh, managing director of a, a, a company I owned then, which was um, which was a headhunting business, actually. I used to find oh, right. senior executive level staff for uh, big businesses. And um, uh, it got to the point where, uh, I was going to have to give up two fat lardies because it was just encroaching too much on my on my working day, and you 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 can't you can't well I don't think I couldn't successfully run two businesses. Um, and uh, my wife said to me, "Hold on a minute, don't don't chuck it in yet. The, our younger daughter has just about to go to big school. That um, that will mean both girls are at the same school. They're both 
can be picked up at the same time, dropped off at the same time. I can go back to work. So she went back to work and um, helped support everything as the uh, as I went full time with two fat lardies, um, which was um, which was a fairly tough period of time. But what I mean, there, there are several. Um, uh, well, a couple of key markers in that journey that really made things work. The first one was selling things in PDF format, mm. because once you start selling things in PDF format, you have access to the whole world, and the whole world has access to you mm. immediately. And we certainly find that these days what um, customers want is they want things as soon as they can possibly get it. Mm. I think that's true of everybody. You know, I, I ordered... Uh, I ordered a plant sprayer the other day from Amazon on Sunday lunchtime because I wanted to fill it full of water and PVA and then spray some models I'd made to hold the flock in, in place. Yeah. It arrived at 6 o'clock Sunday evening. Oh my it was God. six hours for a three-quid plant sprayer with free postage. Oh and you God. think, this is absurd that we've reached this point, that our demand for immediacy is so great. Anyway... Oh. <clears throat> nevertheless, whatever the rights and wrongs of it are, people love the idea of being able to get rules in PDF. And especially as at that time we were producing all our rules in black and white. Yeah. And that, there was a point of principle there uh, that I felt very, very strongly that the important thing in a set of rules was the, the rules. Yeah. It was not the pictures. It was not the color content. Yeah. It, that didn't matter. The important thing was that the rules were good. Yeah. And, of course, I was completely wrong. <laughs> However... <laughs> At that point in time, it looked it was good because people would buy a set of black and white rules and they'd print them out. And what is the point in having them posted to you, ready printed, when they're only black and white? Yeah. So that meant at that time our sales leapt by about 800% oh um, because so many more people were buying them in Australia and America mm. and so on and so forth. So that was one thing that... Can uh, we put that, a date to this, Rich? So roughly when was that? I have no idea, Henry. Ten years no, ago? Ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, when, where, 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 what did we produce? We were producing in black and white at that point in time. I would say, uh, let's say ten years ago. Right. Let's say 12 years ago, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, 12 years ago um, was when I had to go full-time. And the reason I had to go full-time with the business was because it had got so busy. So right. the two must have been linked. Yeah, so yeah. let's 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 go with that as a date. Yeah. It ain't far off and um, um who cares anyway. Um, <laughs> the next the next important milestone was going full colour. Um B we always said we're not gonna go full colour, there's no need. As I say, this is a point of principle, we don't need to do it. And then we just found that people were saying, Come on, Rich, we really do want full colour and pretty pictures. Yeah. And I can't remember we we produced through the mud and the blood with a with a colour middle section, uh, about about eight pages, mm. which had some really lovely photographs of Sydney Randwood's First World War terrain. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was good. And at the time, a lot of um, War Games rules were produced in the same format. Even Flames of War uh, books at that point in time had black and white sections mainly, and some colour sections. So we weren't out of step with them. Um, and we then decided that we were going to go full colour. And I honestly can't remember what the first full colour thing we did was. But suffice to say, we again saw um, uh, exposure to people who, for some reason, weren't buying black and white rules and didn't take rules seriously unless they were in colour. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of people on the, on the internet who, who moan on, on forums who moan and groan about this. There's no necessity to have colour in your publications. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But my view of that is actually if that exposes, and this is what's happened to us, if that exposes your product to more potential customers, therefore more people buy them and go, oh, Actually, these aren't just pretty. They're also a really good set of rules. Yep, yep. They then go, oh, I'll buy those black and white ones that I never considered because I've now discovered that. And they will then go on to say, in future, when the two fat lardies produce a set of rules, I'll buy them sight unseen. Mm. Now, that means that our print runs have increased to a point where when we do a first print run on something like Chain of Command or Sharp Practice, we're looking at 6,000 copies. Mm. Now, that will give us economies of scale. Economies of scale come in there. Yeah. When we first produced 
through the mud and the blood, which is staple bound with an eight page central color section. I think we were selling them for 18 quid. Yeah. Now we're selling chain of command, f perfect bound, full color throughout. And the benefit of color is not just pretty pictures because I actually don't put that many pretty pictures in. What I do is I put a lot of illustrations in. Yeah. So every point in the rules will have an illustration in full color, which allows people to, to see that. The fact that the figures are also pretty helps. Um, but that then means that that set of rules is £24. Yeah. Now, so we're talking about a relatively small uplift in cost yeah. for a much, much more attractive product. Yeah. So by going to colour, that allowed us, allowed us to achieve economies of scale, and that then has also, combined with the fact more people are, bu are buying the rules, it's not such a risk. It's obviously a risk every time we produce any set of rules. Yeah. Because the contribution, when, you, when you're going in there and you're putting, let's say, £40,000 mm. into the set of rules and the tokens to go with it and any ancillary bits and pieces, you are taking a big risk. If people go, actually, I'm not going to buy them, then you are, technical term is buggered, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, but by, by knowing that you've achieved a loyal customer base, who are there to support you because they like what you do and therefore are prepared to put their money where their mouth is, that takes away some of that risk and allows you to get that benefit. So that they are the two key points. And interestingly, now we're in full colour, we do still sell a lot of stuff in PDF, but we tend to find that the rules sell more in hard copy now than in PDF. Oh, that's interesting. Because people will go, actually, I don't want to print them out. But what we are seeing now is more people going, I don't need to print them out because I'm looking at them on my iPad yes, or yes. other tablets are available. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different things that are making what we do more accessible. When we first started producing the summer and Christmas special in 2004, people would go, we really love this, but we've got to print it all out. Hundreds and 130 pages, yeah. 140 pages. Well, nowadays, we're all used to reading our magazines on our tablets. Yep. You know, I, I, I don't really buy hard copy magazines anymore. Mm. I just take them on my tablet because it's a lot easier for me to store them there. Mm. I can access them more readily. And I've got sh shelves and shelves full of every copy of War Games Illustrated up to about 400 or whatever 300 or whatever they're up to and every copy of miniature war games up to a few years ago mm -hmm. um which did make me think with phil on last time that i should be saying to him how would you like to take a skip full of magazines on me <laughs> um, but, yeah but i it so some of the things that we did that at the time didn't necessarily um uh weren't necessarily that attractive are now very much very attractive because people just read them on their on their tablets yeah. so lots of factors have come together but yeah i mean this year we uh, well i don't know about this financial year because we haven't finished it but last calendar year january the 1st to december the 31st you know we sold um some way over a quarter of a million pounds worth of rules which is a lot i mean what we oh, don't yeah. do of course what we don't do of course is sell figures so where we are in the grand um, you know, uh, scheme of who's the biggest company. I'm not bothered because mm. it's you're not comparing eggs with eggs. Yeah, yeah. But I'd say we certainly sell. Um, we, we, I mean, Chain of Command has already sold twenty four thousand uh, copies. After we finish this conversation, I'm going to the printer to pick up another three thousand copies, wow. which is new print run. Now, for many many publishers, three thousand pounds. No, sorry, three thousand copies. Is a lot more than their initial print runs. So we've 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 established ourselves as a business. Now, is that important? Well, it is important that we are taken seriously because we you you do have an effect where people don't buy a game if they think they won't be able to play it with any of their mates. Yeah. So they it's important that they potential customers can see that there is a, a core number of people who are going to be buying those rules as well. And who are going to want to be able to to uh, to play it with them? But on the other hand, when businesses get big, it tends to mean that the people at the top become invisible. Mm. Now we definitely do not want to become invisible. We want to retain our contact yeah. uh, with with our customers um, and and very much with the community. We're there to attend the 
games days, the shows, to yeah. take demos to club. You know, we still get clubs contacting us saying, would you mind coming up to our local club and running the game out? These are small businesses approaches which are still core yeah. to what we do despite the size of the business. And I don't want us to ever lose touch yeah. with being the war gamers that we are and just playing games with other people. Yeah, I mean, I do spend a lot more time doing VAT returns and paying VAT in 28 different European countries or whatever it is. Um, and I do employ staff to pack the post and monitor forums so that I can be alerted whether which questions I need to respond to. Yeah. But I'm still involved at all levels. I pack envelopes and I answer questions on social media on a daily basis. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's important that, I, that Nick and I remain grounded and are still doing the important things that are core to the business and not losing sight of that and going sitting in an ivory tower. So it, it is important that we're taken seriously, but also I don't. It's 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 important that we keep level headed and and keep mm. doing what we're doing for the community. I think uh, you made an important point there, kind of in passing, that you're. I mean, previously, you the first thing is you mentioned the large community, which of course is a is a fantastic thing, which uh, uh, is is kind of a two way street because of course your it enables you, it gives you an avenue into the, your community of players, uh, but also of course it gives you access to that community of customers, you know, because they they're one and the same thing. And the social media thing, as as I know, you know, like like me you guys have been uh, were early adopters of social media because yeah. like me you realize well a lot of this and we're going to be probably mention the patron thing later but so much today is if you like about building a tribe that the new business model is not just the is not like the old business model where you you know we're the company you're the customers this is what we're selling you take it or leave it that mm. model is outmold outmoded and if you try to follow it these days basically you're going to fail and obviously we do see many small companies where people <laughs> aren't prepared to kind of adopt new methods where they they flourish for a while and then they disappear almost without trace you nowadays if you're going to survive you have to be adaptable and you have to of course be adaptable to the new way that media works i mean just simply pro placing press ads these days won't get you anywhere you have to be accessible and it's obviously one of the difficult things to manage isn't it that you know div dividing your time between the necessary tasks that you must perform to make the business function but yeah. also uh, uh, understanding and uh, and consenting to this notion of community of tribe where people do want to be able to reach you they want to see that you're human that you're accessible that you will answer questions and it's, I think this is another reason why people like you and I who are reasonably extrovert in our personality, we can deal with this kind of thing reasonably well. Mm. But also, you know, I enjoy it. Like you, I kind of enjoy it. If we go on Twitter, you know, we bump into each other on Twitter and there's some some fantastic banter. I mean, one of those interesting yeah. things that I talk to people about all the time is, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, you'd say to, oh, you know, are you, are you on Twitter? You've got a Twitter account. Oh, no. Why would I want to be on Twitter? People talking about what they had for lunch. Well, it makes you laugh, actually, because as almost ironically, sometimes we, we will talk about what we've had for lunch or currently breakfast in veganry right <laughs> but most of the time the banter that you have we have in the war games community online is brilliant you know some of it's just yeah, downright yeah. funny this that yeah. exchange of information that we talked about earlier about the you know people yeah. talking about their projects oh i've tried this painting technique oh how about using this this uh, wash instead of that wash something of that kind. i mean it's just it's a wonderful sense of community that's being building online for quite a long time now and i remember you know you talking about selling rule sets as pdf i remember because uh, I think, actually, you, Two Fat Lardies 
kind of went full time around about the same time I started Battle Games, which was kind of mm. 2006, wasn't it? 2005, 2006. And, but I can remember, what was it, 2008 or 9? I was the first person to start selling my magazine as in PDF format online. Yeah. And yeah. I remember people, oh, you don't want to do that. People are just going to steal your magazine or you won't make any money. And the opposite was true. Suddenly, it mushroomed. Yeah, and yeah. I'm sure there were a few people out there who might have, you know, nicked, tried to nick a copy or got a copy of some bloody awful download site. But actually, it was so few. And the customer loyalty was amazing. People would email me, say, oh, Henry, I thought you ought to know. I've seen your magazine on this naughty yeah, website. Yeah. Yeah, you ought to write to them, get them to take it down. So, and certainly, I mean, I've, I, there's two ways of looking at the world. It's always the glass half full or the glass half empty yeah. syndrome. Although I tend to say it's never full enough. Mm. Um, but it, um, you either say of people, people are all thieving rotters, or you say actually people are all decent people. And I, uh, well, it, the answer is neither of those. But I do firmly believe it's much more close to the latter than the former. People yeah. are generally decent human beings. And if they see you being robbed, because let's face it, if people are chucking your magazine out for free or some of my products for free, they are actually undermining our business. It, it is theft. Um, they tend to, to let you know. And the other thing, to be honest with you, these dubious websites, do you really want to download what somebody else has uploaded and may be infected with all sorts of yeah. heebie-jeebies that you don't know about and could pick up on your, on your computer? So yeah. my attitude is you have to allow for the fact that there is going to be a, a degree of that done by nasty people, shall we say, in polite terms. Uh, <laughs> but the vast majority of people recognize the fact that it's it's our livelihood, yeah. um, and if they like your rules, in, in my case, they're not going to try and undermine your business because they know that that will be the end of the game and there'll be no more rules coming. Yeah. So I, I like to view it that most people are decent, honest human beings, and um, it, it doesn't happen very much at all, and I honestly believe it doesn't happen very much at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it is interesting, and... I, I've certainly, I've, there's, I won't name any names, but there have been people who I've had conversations with over the years where I noticed that they were using certain things that I designed mm. uh, without reference to me. And I contacted them and had that conversation with them. You, you do understand that if you keep doing that, I lose all incentive to do more of these things that you say you love because what yeah. would be the point of me doing them? Because I can't afford to do them for free. You know, yeah, and, yeah. and and I have managed to convert several people to realizing that, oh, yeah, th this isn't a victimless crime. Copyright theft is not a victimless crime because no. someone has taken that photograph, created that map, done that illustration, written those rules, whatever it happens to be, and is relying on that often to feed the family. You know, let's. Yeah, let's not absolutely. Be Look at my point about a 40 grand front end investment. If everybody decided, if one bloke bought it and gave it to everybody else and they all nicked it, my 40 grand investment is all of a sudden turning into a 39,990, uh, 980 pound debt. Yeah. Um, and that is definitely not victimless. That would, that would be the end of, of, of my business. Yeah. Uh, so you, it, as you say, it's not victimless. But the good thing is, uh, people are not horrible, nasty yeah. characters. They're generally very good. Yeah, and I, I have to say, compared to when it first started, the number of uh, times this has cropped up, for me at least, a touch wood, and maybe I'm lucky, has reduced to an infinitesimally tiny amount. Uh, mm. And and particularly now since I started the Patreon thing, I think it, if nothing else, that just puts it front and centre that, guys, this is my living. You know, this is not <laughs> something I'm just doing as a hobby. I, I'm relying on this for a living. So yeah. don't nick it. Anyway, let, mm. that's been really interesting, hearing more about kind of the business side of Two Fat Lardies, because I bet m most of the people out there won't have heard this story uh, uh, about two fat lardies or understood the scale of your operation you know it's, it's it's a major undertaking and actually quite remarkable that effectively it's still just you and nick 
<laughs> you know. Oh well, no, it's it's not actually. You know, we've got you know we've got we've got you know a post room, and we've got um, you know the guy who manages um, the uh, forums for me, and you know right. doing all that. So it's it's not quite just us, but. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know Dave uh, Dave Brown uh, is involved writing rules for our sister company Rise of Its Press, which yeah. is um, uh, you know very much under the same banner. So um, you know we are we are growing and we are looking to encourage other game developers to come on board. But it's um, um, it's a case of uh, you know trying to balance the number of hours in a day. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at some of the. Uh, mm. kind of meat of potatoes uh now mm. um i mean first of all talking about games you've run and stuff and it, interestingly not a game at a show but the game that nick was talking to me about a couple of weeks ago just before christmas that you were at that time planning to run which was that enormous uh one day or in fact compressed into three hours discord uh, kind of mini campaign Kriegspiel thing, uh, yeah. which I, you know, bless your heart, you guys said, oh, Henry, you know, and you're granting me access to be an observer. Well, all I can say is, even just as an observer, observer, it was mind blowing. Uh, it's I'm I am thinking about trying to write a, a blog post about what I witnessed because it, you know, the, the the Duke of Wellington said of describing a battle that you might as well try and describe a ball, you know, a dance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at, because the speed at which messages were being exchanged in umpteen different kind of online rooms within the overall discord chat room thing was extraordinary and because you and nick were were umpiring this thing it, that must rich have been three of the most frantic hours of your life surely uh well no it's worse than that actually <laughs> <laughs> um, for a start it's it, an interesting thing is the the um the process of the creek spiel that we were running uh, and we, we we use this term, we say, we'll do the Kriegsville and then we'll have the three-hour game at the end. Uh, actually, that's the game at the end isn't. The game is the whole process because the planning, the planning exercise yeah. is part, uh, very much part of the game. How those guys were interacting, making their plans, uh, that um, was interesting for the defending side, for example. I was involved in some of the... Um, uh, issues that they had to deal with because the the creek spill that we did had had an air mobile force parachute and glider born landing on some defenders. So whilst the uh, air mobile force were uh, doing their planning, the defenders were sat there twiddling their thumbs to a degree. Mm. So I had an opportunity to give them some issues to deal with. So I created some social unrest in the main town, which the garrison had to deal with. I created issues like food shortages. They had a home guard to deal with who were actually using their role to settle political scores. Yeah. So think of, you know, fall of the Third Reich type thing, you know, yeah. with the Sturm Abteilung going around knocking anybody on the head that they thought didn't deserve to survive. Um, you had a town commander who was a complete and utter defeatist. And really providing that backdrop was interesting to examine because it allowed us to see just how easily minor events can trigger larger ones. Um, for example, there was an issue with a food shortage. So one of their commanders sent some lorries north to, to get some supplies <clears throat> from the central supply depot in the capital. Meanwhile, one of the other uh, players had advised the civilian population to leave and head north because of the enemy were approaching and it was going to be a battle zone. Yeah. Well, of course, all of a sudden, these supplies that are heading north are meeting hordes and hordes of refugees who are, who are completely clogging the roads, and that exacerbates the food shortage issue. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. You're able to examine issues that you don't necessarily get in a normal tabletop war game. Yeah. So, so that was one of them. The actual hard work in delivering the, I don't know what we should really call it, I suppose we should call it something like um, resolution phase, that three hours of what we would typically call a game. Mm. Um, took a lot of work because we got in all the orders from all the different players telling us what they were going to do with their troops, how their troops were divided, what the glider load was, how they were allocating their support troops. And Nick said to me, 
Oh, he said, I'm going to decorate my dining room today. Would you mind having a look through these? Well, I had a quick look and I thought, bloody hell, this is going to take forever. So prior to the three hours of the game, I had nine hours crunching through all the orders, <coughs> working out what happened, where the paras landed, where the gliders landed, and working out all the small combat, and then writing all the reports back to their commanders so they were pre-written and that then allowed for the fast distribution of messages yeah. once we hit the ground yeah. so it's the preparation in at the front end that actually takes a lot of effort once yeah. the game then starts uh well it, it's very interesting for me nick became the conduit for me providing him with the information for what was happening and he was in the chat rooms distributing that information to the right. players Right. So he's telling the Red uh, red Airborne commander that he's got this information through from a company. Uh, he'd be telling him he hadn't got any communications yet with his artillery, which yeah. should have landed over there, but he hadn't heard anything. Yeah. So he would be giving that information while I was working out where troops were moving to and what and resolving any combat that came as a result of that. Right. So for me... I was moving the pieces on the, the table, if you like, mm. resolving the combat, and I had a better idea than anybody of what was actually happening mm. because I could see that um, happening in front of me on, on, the, on the map as I moved the, the pieces around because we still do use physical pieces on, on a map. Mm. Um, and uh, that, that, that part is tremendously interesting. But, yeah, it's, uh, it does take a lot of hard work and a lot of planning even using very very simple combat resolution systems, which you have to do, yeah, so you can you can generate results and get that information fed back to the players. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think learning from Creepspeed is about seeing how players react and respond to limited and imperfect information, and how friction comes to play uh, is largely due to player presumptions, unintended consequences. So that traffic jam. Completely unintended consequences. Yeah, One yeah. player thought he was doing the right thing to provide food for the people. The other player thought he was doing the right thing, telling the people to clear off. Yeah. And then that resulted in neither having a good outcome yeah. and resulted in more unrest in the town, resulted in the town commandant deserting his post and things like that. Yeah. And that, <coughs> excuse me, for the defending player, how do you deal with that? Because you still have an obligation if you're the senior man there and you've got yeah. all this civilian population yeah. that presents all sorts of pressures where you're, you know, um, please go away. I'm trying to fight a battle yeah, yeah. is what the military commander is thinking. But he has to deal with these yeah. other issues. So it, it, it provides opportunities to um, have more of a holistic approach to what's going on it's a bit like dungeons and dragons to a degree yeah, yeah. talking about earlier you have to create a plausible response to what's happening i used to uh, help paddy griffith do a lot of creepspiel games at the imperial war museum and uh, paddy used to say right the way you do it is you decide what's the worst possible result what is the best possible result and you roll a d6 if you get a one, it's the worst one. If you get a six, it's the best one. If you get anything else, it's somewhere in between. And once you've accepted, once you've let go, it's, mm. you know, no hands, mum. It's, it's daring to let go that is the hardest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and once you've, you, you've got used to that concept, it, it actually comes quite easily, especially when you've been taught by a master like Paddy. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that that must have made a huge difference, the association that you had with all those uh, over those years with Paddy Griffiths, of course, is one of the great you know, military historians and certainly someone who made people think hard about a lot of assumptions that have been made in military history, um, yeah. in, including, for example, you know, the, the British British musketry in the, in the Napoleonic Wars, for example, was one where he, I remember he pointed out that actually what they tended to do was wait, 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 fire one volley, then charge in with cold steel. But, uh, but that's kind of off subject a minute one of the things that i want i wanted to say that i noticed was the absolutely fantastic way and the totally realistic reactions that the players had in this discord game to the lack of uh viable information reaching them that people were 
often left i'm sure deliberately left waiting they want because in a normal war game okay so what's the state of that battalion over there and you just look across the table and there oh it's i think it's lost a stand out of its so it's down to five stands from its initial six so you can instantly make an assessment all right a judgment in your head of how long it's going to last and, and how effective it might be in this situation it was great because you were also changing that information because oh uh, looks like losses on landing might have been as high as 60 percent amongst yeah. you know the paratro- paratroopers or whatever and of course the paratroop commander you know jay or whoever it was go, oh my god that's appalling that's absolutely dreadful that's awful i've got almost no one left and how they reacted to that but then as the situation developed oh yes it turns out actually losses weren't actually that bad but mm-hmm. but in that initial very human <clears throat> reaction that people had to that what is a dr- you know to a civilian sure certainly even a, a moderately trained soldier still an appallingly frightening dangerous situation that isn't an everyday occurrence where it yeah. can seem suddenly that your command has dissolved but in fact all that's happening is people have dropped in penny packets and they're having to re-establish communication yeah. and let the boss further up the line say oh actually i am still alive we are functioning but that takes time um I, this i'm gonna do a quote because uh, you know friction and stuff is something that we i, I really want to talk to you about today because it informs so much of what you do um mm. and uh, you know this is where <clears throat> i'm going to take a couple of minutes and a swig of my tea to say to people that if, if you're out there, there are two um, military theorists who, if people haven't read them yet, they should certainly have heard of them. Uh, they, they they were contemporaries, actually, in the Napoleonic Wars. Quite interesting. You've got Baron Antoine Henri de Jomini, uh, yeah. who wrote The Art of War, uh, which I've got in my right hand here. And I've got uh, Karl von Clausewitz, of course, on war. Um, who is also famous. Now, they were both... Uh, Jomini was French. Uh, Clausewitz was Prussian. Um, uh, Jomini, interesting case, actually. He, he served under Napoleon on the staff, but Berthier got so fed up with him... <laughs> That they he had he had rows with Berthier, Napoleon's chief of staff, and actually left and joined the Russian army instead, which is interesting. And then fought against <laughs> the French in eighteen twelve to fourteen. Uh, Clausewitz, on the other hand, was with the Prussians, and he was particularly noted uh, involved at Ligny, I I believe. But anyway, two very interesting writers, quite different. Interestingly, Clausewitz's work. Uh, the, this one on war wasn't published until after his death in 1832 I think it was he, he uh, it published by his wife after his death mm. whereas Jomini in fact uh, during the early 19th century was better known uh, he, he his book went around and there's a reason for that and because of the difference between the two Jomini is less of a philosopher he's more of actually a military tactician a strategy and tactics theorist isn't he yeah. and actually yeah. in the series i'm writing for war game soldiers and strategy i'm going to be refer- referring to germany because he actually writes a lot about well i here are some recommended tactical formations that you could yeah. use on the battlefield here's the order of march that i recommend you use on campaign that kind of thing he actually ha- says uh, almost nothing about what I want to talk to you about, which is friction. His right. his approach is very much more, well, here's some really sound principles that are well tested. So if you follow these principles, it should it should go well for you. It certainly go better for you than someone who hasn't studied these principles, That's which right. almost kind of ignores the question of friction. Now, Clausewitz, on the other hand, uh, whilst it's not a long chapter, uh, I've actually got the Penguin Classics version of Clausewitz on war. He he does in chapter seven. He has a short. Get biscuits with it. Uh, sorry. Do you get biscuits with it? <laughs> Penguin biscuits. Very good. Eat all the chocolate off. But he has, it's a short chapter. It's only like three and a bit pages, but at least he does have a chapter about friction. I actually want to read a short, 
a short passage, if I may. And it says, uh, everything is very simple in war, but the simplest thing is difficult. These difficulties accumulate and produce a friction which no man can imagine exactly who has not seen war. Suppose now a traveller who towards evening expects to accomplish the two stages at the end of his day's journey, four or five leagues, with post horses on the high road. It is nothing. He arrives now at the last station but one, finds no horses, or very bad ones, then a hilly country, bad roads, it's a dark night, and he's glad when, after a great deal of trouble, he reaches the next station and finds there some miserable accommodation. So in war, through the influence of an infinity of petty circumstances, which cannot properly be described on paper, things disappoint us and we fall short of the mark. A powerful iron will overcome this friction. It crushes the obstacles, but certainly the machine along with them. We shall often meet with this result. Like an obelisk towards which the principal streets of a town converge, the strong will of a proud spirit stands prominent and commanding in the middle of the art of war. Now, I I bookmarked umpteen quotes that I could come up with, but I think that's sort of the core quote, isn't it? By what you often refer to as friction rich and why you write your rules the way you do because what you want to confront players with is the obvious fact that you know <coughs> even a good plan can go awry so tell me yeah. rich when did you first uh, you know start read when did you first remember reading about friction what, when did you feel like yes this is definitely something important to me that i want to communicate via my rule sets how did that come about um really the the, the it's it was a creeping process i uh as when i was about 21 i bought a copy of the rice fits crucible rules which um um were advertised in military modeling and we we now publish a version of uh translated by bill leeson um, and I realized that these, this was potentially a, a war game, a game developer's Bible, because it had so much information in there. But rather like Jomini, it focused on what was possible rather than what would happen. Yeah. So if you had pioneers, they would achieve 24 feet of bridge in a three-hour period. Yeah. Uh, so that was good, but it, it made me realize that, that, that that was purely theory. And at the time, um, I picked up a copy of Clausewitz uh, and read that and was very taken with the fact that his view of war and I think, I mean, you know, there are many quotes. Everything in war is simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. Mm. Um, I think kind of sums it up. Um, he, he goes on about saying that um, action in war is like a movement in a resistant element. So it's yes. like um, walking in water is the the uh, comparison he makes. You know, it's it's walking is easy, but when you try doing it in water, you fall over more yeah. easily. You you know, you don't move as quickly as you think you do. Um, so he. What he was saying was confirming what I had read about in so many accounts of battles that I've read, where people, it could be anything from a general saying, we expected General So-and-So's brigade to arrive on our right flank at two o'clock, but it didn't arrive. It could be A and B company of the Loamshires were due to kick off the advance at 0500. The barrage was going in, but when we got to their jump off point, there was nobody there. Uh, and often these accounts go, don't go into, gosh, that must be friction of war. They just <laughs> go, there was nobody there. Or it's, or it's uh, a platoon officer saying, I sent Sergeant Jones round on the right flank with his section to put down covering fire. But where is he? Where's Jones? We've no idea. Well, the reason is that whilst you, when you are moving your unit on a table with a six-inch move, know that Sergeant Jones, Corporal Jones will be there in four turns because it's 24 inches away the actual um platoon officer has no idea how long exactly it will take mm. to move that distance what he does have is he has uh he has the ability to to predict 
how long he thinks it will take mm. because the movement shouldn't be completely random. Mm. It should just be variable so that it, he can have, he should know that it's far more likely that a unit will advance seven inches than two inches or 12 inches, yep. but he shouldn't know with absolute certainty. So you certainly get the friction where people are, um, uh, dealing with other players uh, in large games. Now, I'll give you an example. We played, we refought Waterloo uh, yeah. using General Darme uh, uh, last summer. Yeah. And um, I was Napoleon. I was severely hampered by um, uh, my ability to do anything because they didn't want us to have too much knowledge. So I was told that I was ill in the Belle Alliance and I could issue orders in writing only. So I issued orders to uh, Sid, who was one of my subordinate commanders, and the orders I gave him were totally clear, could not have been misread in any way, shape or form. Until several hours later, when I was allowed to look at the table, that moronic fool had done something completely different, <laughs> which he then tried to rationalise to me and telling me that he conformed exactly with my orders. Now, that is a friction that you get with gamers. But at the same time, the reason that I believe that it's important to introduce more friction in there is because things are not Predictable. Now, funnily enough, the thing that we do this with all the time in every war game set of rules is firing. Yeah. yeah. You you will never say, I know exactly what result I'm going to get from my battalion firing, because yeah. that would be silly. Yeah. So what we do is we roll dice and that tells us how effective our fire has been. Yeah. However, when we move troops, somehow we know exactly how far they're going to move. Yeah. And with the idea of applying dice to seeing, well, will they move, you know, an average amount or or on some extreme role, not move, move very far at all, or equally extreme, move a long way, seems an odd idea. When in fact, why is it odd? It's perfectly normal. That's what a commander in reality has to has to face with. So it's it's important, I think, if a war game is representing the command challenges of the historical counterpart, then we need to provide some of that uncertainty that those that, that the real life counterparts had. Well, is that negative? It depends really what you want from your game. I mean, some people tell me that the command dice in chain of command are simply there to ruin their day. And, <laughs> and to stop them moving all the units that they want to move. On the other hand, a more enlightened view would to say, be to say that the command dice in chain of uh, command present you with a challenge. How am I going to utilise? It's an imperfect. It's imperfect. I cannot do everything that I want to do, mm. but how do I use the dice that I've rolled to achieve as much as possible towards my objective? And the ability, for example, to add dice up, to make different numbers allows you to try and make the best combination possible. Mm. Um, now, some other systems where people simply draw uh, draw a card or draw a dice or a bag or whatever, and that allows them to move one unit, mm. I would say it's far more chaotic because not only does it not allow you to move all of your force, it only allows you to move one unit. Yeah. At least yeah. within chain of command, you have options to put together some interesting phases of play, play where one unit fires uh, and another unit manoeuvres or one unit fires suppression fire yeah. uh, while another unit then does something completely different. It's utilising, uh, it's embracing the imperfection of the situation and trying to uh, minimise the friction by achieving as much as you possibly can do that replicates the command challenge of any commander, whatever their level, whether they're, they're commanding a platoon or a battalion or a division or a corps. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I feel that friction is important in our games, because it simply replicates the uncertainty that is present in all forms of warfare. Now, I'm not saying that games that don't provide that are a load of rubbish. I'm just saying that that's the type of game that I enjoy playing. Yeah. Um, and, and fortunately, we find that lots of other people enjoy playing them as well. It doesn't make it better than any other old system. It's just the yeah. type of game it's like. When you uh, approach a rule set, I mean, uh, the command dice thing, I mean, 
from my point of view, I, I, as always, when I get to play a set of your rules, I always find it thought provoking. You know, whether whether I love it or hate it, I always come away thinking, well, that's really interesting. I've had a really interesting experience regardless of anything else. Uh, what I've come to appreciate is that actually what you're also seem to be quite good at. I'm thinking here of, say, sharp practice and chain of command at the moment is you're quite good at coming up with mechanisms that seem appropriate for that particular historical period as well. And and the level of tactics being approached, because certainly what I, I've you know, I don't always like the outcome, but I've come to appreciate about chain of command, for example, is that that kind of um, almost um, well, that very challenging micro decision making is seems very appropriate for that platoon level kind of action where yeah. uh, you are talking about small groups of men who are dispersed across the landscape, some of them in hiding, you know, uh, and therefore the officer can't even physically see them. And that seems to actually be completely appropriate for that setting in a way yeah. that it might not for, say, a Napoleonic company level action. Yeah, or yeah. something. So, how does that inform your thinking? Is, is, is what kind of task? How do you view the task as you're approaching? Uh, you know, you're taking on a new period of history, and you're looking at the mechanics that are, would be most appropriate for that period. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it it really is trying to get to the uh, nub of what's what is the game about? What what are the commanders attempting to do because the emphasis in in all of our games i think is on how big men how you know significant leaders stand up and take charge of a situation to try and get their men to achieve more than the average outcome mm. and one of the things that i that, that i look at in that is i say right how do they influence the battlefield. Now, in chain of command, what we were looking to do was to say, look, you know, this is a chaotic battlefield, often potentially an empty battlefield in as much as you can't see all your men, they can't see you. So the command dice present you with what can I, how can I influence the battle at this very moment in time? And you, you're then making what effectively are split second decisions. Yeah. How do I get the best in this 10 second phase of phase of the action yeah. whereas with with a sharp practice some of the mechanisms are similar you know the movement mechanisms are similar the firing mechan mechanisms are similar but in sharp practice what we're doing there we use a totally different system there where we've got a card deck or poker chips if people prefer we're using the flags in that uh, uh, deck to allow the commanders to get their men to achieve that bit better than they would if they were left to their own devices it's very much about getting the men to achieve three rounds a minute yeah. it's about influencing those men can i get my men to speed up and march and get to the bridge quicker than your men yeah, yeah. because we're not moving at six inches i might beat you there even though i'm far further away i might get my men to step out and really get there can i get my men then to to present their, do I want them to present their weapons and try and deliver a controlled volley, or do I make the decision we're just going to start blazing away instantly? Mm -hmm. If I make that decision, can I get my men back under control at the point where I want to charge in on you? You look at the uh, War of 1866, where the Prussians went into action against the Austrians with these, they developed this concept of huge schwarm, which are greatly thick skirmish mm. teams, where the whole battalion potentially would be out there skirmishing and they get into a firefight with the Austrians and they've reached the point where they wanted to charge in and make contact but because they were so dispersed they couldn't get the men to stop firing yeah. so it's looking at issues like that it's how do you how do you uh, get the best out of, of your men one minute it might be by getting them to blaze away but by doing that you potentially take the risk of losing control of them and they're just going to when you say stop firing let it's time to advance they're not going to hear you yeah, yeah. so it's a case of trying to replicate the command challenges that are pertinent for that particular con conflict
Yeah. Uh, interesting you talk about the, the these dispersed formations and the tendency of men once they start firing not to want to stop. Uh, it makes me think immediately the American Civil War, uh, where, you know, th there yeah. are many officers schooled at West Point who think, yes, what we want to do is that sort of British thing where we advance close, loose a valley and then yeah, cut charge for. But once those guys start firing, uh, first yeah. of all, yes, obviously it's it's less easy for them to hear the commands being given but also yeah. the guy they they feel safe in that repetitive action don't they oh, load shoot. fire load fire that gives them a sense of security and they don't want to move from that spot uh, no. which is a really interesting phenomenon you know that's often yeah. overlooked in, in war games rules that you know once a unit starts firing it's actually going to unless it's a, an extremely well trained unit it's going to feel uh, less inclined to then carry on advancing after to that point um so yeah that that's really interesting i mean as you've been talking i've been looking through you know glancing down at my klaus Fitz book again you know and uh, and things like uh, the theoretic all sounds very well the commander of a battalion is responsible for the execution of the order given and as the battalion by its discipline is glued together into one piece and the chief must be a man of acknowledged zeal the beam turns on an iron pin with little friction but it is not so in reality and all that is that is exaggerated and false in such a conception manifests itself once in war the battalion always remains composed of a number of men of whom if chance so wills the most insignificant is able to occasion delay and even irregularity the danger which war brings with it the bodily exertions which it requires augment this evil so much that they must be regarded as the greatest causes of it you know it's exactly what you're saying rich so Mm. Uh, brilliant and one of the things I also wanted to ask you, you know, obviously you're famous for writing your own rule sets and you obviously spend a huge amount of time playtesting and you know running games with your own rules uh, are there any other rule sets that actually not written by you that you admire from the past or are currently available that you even if you don't get time, you you know you sneakingly acknowledge. Oh, actually, that's a, that's a pretty good rule set. Yeah, uh, I, well, I can go big, big, big headline act. Black powder. I'm really interested by the way they represent friction. You know, their uh, their units rushing ahead is every bit as much friction as are they rushing ahead or are the other units lagging behind? Mm. So uh, I, I, I'm quite impressed with some of the ideas in there, although I, I barely ever played it. But there, there have been some great games that have really inspired me that are equally almost totally unknown. Duncan McFarlane in the 80s did a competition as very much a counterweight to these great big new breed rule books and things like that called Rules on the Back of a Postcard. Yeah. And there was a set of rules there called Drums Along the Watusi by a chap, oh. I think, called Richard Brooks. And it was basically you took your Dr. Livingstone and his porters and a few Ascari up the Watusi River uh, looking for whatever you were looking for. And uh, it was completely random what happened. You know, people would leap out of the bushes and attack you or a tiger might come out or I can't even remember the details. But just the fact that those rules, that, that Duncan got people thinking about how to create a set of rules on the back of a postcard really, really inspired me at a time when my uh, hobby was very much replicating that with our local sort of very mm. creative club. And and that set of rules have always stuck in my mind. Uh, I played them at a conference of war gamers, I think 1984, at Newston Hall, where the war games, what they call war games development group, yep. I think, um, uh, still meet every year, although I, the last time I went was 1984. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it was, you know, some interesting ideas. And I do think it would be a lovely idea to try and uh, encourage people to come out with more interesting ideas. One of the things I do find odd is that if you look at the board game market or card game market, mm. there is a tremendous amount of innovation. And you go to these big shows and you will find them talking about innovative new ideas that are stimulating people to, to play them and enjoy those games. Whereas in tabletop wargaming, there almost feels like there is a pressure to go the other way. 
and to mm. create rules which are inoffensive. Yeah, that yeah, the yeah. emphasis the emphasis a lot is a lot more on look at the toys on the table aren't they pretty and let's find a set of rules that won't offend anybody i wrote about this in my column once i worked for a brewery when i had my pub and they decided that they wanted to replicate the best bitter that they had when this was when real ale was coming back in yeah and they said we're going to have a competition and we're going to get all these old boys in, you know, with faces that have sunk a thousand pints. <laughs> and get them in the, and the, the head brewer was going to try and not replicate what they had before, but make 10 or 12 different beers. And these old boys were going to choose the one that was most like the original best bitter that they remembered. That's how the exercise started. By the end of the day, the exercise was to find the beer that offended the least number of people. Yeah. Not that most people liked, yeah. but that most people could drink and not be upset by it, yeah. which meant that the new Best Bitter was an entirely bland, insipid nothingness that people, the masses, would drink, yeah. uh, but they didn't have to enjoy it very much. Yeah. And my concern is that... that um, we we are not seeing the reward for um, innovative gaming mm. uh, coming through in the hobby in the way that it is in the board game market or the mm. card game market. We are seeing some pretty bland rules being produced by some of the big producers who are taking the brewery approach, offend as few people as possible, yeah, yeah. don't make as many people as possible impressed or happy with what we're doing and the result is uh, sadly you know we're seeing things that are under play tested and and uh, going out there and whilst everything about the package because these things are packaged very nicely you know with suitable figures and so on and so forth everything looks great but we are getting a lot of customers coming to us saying, "Can you produce a set of rules that can do this?" And we're going, "Well, no, we're not. We're not following a crowd here." Mm. But mm. I, I'd like to see more innovation in the hobby generally, rather than just an attempt not to offend people and keep keep it bland. So yeah. I'm, I'm I'm more inclined to play board games where I do find totally different and new ideas. Don't get me wrong; there are some small companies out there who are producing really interesting rule sets, and I think they are where we were 10 years ago and, and hopefully they they find it you know easier to, to come to the fore in the age of you know the, the uh, universal internet you said two things there that i agree with first of all the the kind of car manufacturers market research approach to war games rules isn't it so you end up yeah. with an awful lot of cars that look just like a ford sierra uh, yeah. kind of thing yeah. uh, and they all look remarkably similar so when you come to actually choose a car it's like well mm. What nothing's got any personality anymore, you yeah, know, yeah, and, exactly. which exactly. is the problem. But the other thing is, however, that at least the small rules writer now does have access to even some of the biggest, you know, publishing outlets in the world. Amazon. I mean, I think you mentioned war games development there. There's a guy called Bob Cordery who yeah, right. has been around for a long time, yeah, who yeah. Ha has been in the last couple of years, has been very happily producing uh, little books printed by Lulu, wherever they are, and also p sent out via Amazon on his hex gaming ideas, right. uh, hex wars and that kind of stuff. Now, you know, they're, they're not earth shattering, but it's a nice little series of, of rule sets that have got merit, you know, and this is a guy who's been wargaming for a very long time. He's got some interesting ideas and his his idea is making a war game manageable for someone who's in straightened domestic circumstances who can afford a few Callistra hexes, hex boards to put on their dining room table and yeah. not very much kit needed with them. And there's some really interesting ideas in there. You know, they're not going to change the world, but at least here's someone who's recognized, OK, I can't go to a conventional publisher with these because they'll laugh at me because they'll say, so what's your potential audience for this? Which is what they do 
when you you approach a conventional publisher these days. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And and we do the same. We do the same. You have to. It's got to be commercially viable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and he realistically was saying, well, you know, it might be a few hundred people. Well, the publisher would probably say, well, that's very nice. Thanks very much. Not interested. We, you know, unless you can guarantee us a thousand sales or whatever. Yeah. 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 So he very sensibly have decided, well, you know, I don't need to go that route at all. I can produce the thing digitally. You might just be doing it in Microsoft Word or whatever, upload it to Lulu or whoever, and it doesn't matter to him. You know, he's already, I think he's retired. A few extra quid a month of income on what is now a growing, you know, set of rule sets. Why not? And I think... And that's all part of the collective, the collective approach to wargaming. And Bob, Bob, Used to write in all uh, the you know uh, yeah. miniature games and that, and and he he was you know an inspirational writer. Yeah. There were when I used to pick up a war game magazine, I'd flick through who's written, and you know if his name's in there, you know yeah. you're in for a you know you're in for a good read. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's again one of the strengths of what we've mentioned now several times in this conversation is the the opportunities that the internet has given us as pro, you know producers yeah. and publishers but also the strength of the community because it doesn't matter how small your tribe is nowadays yeah. you can reach that tribe the avenues you know do exist there um and, and talking about kind of digital and community and stuff i wanted to you know because we're we're coming towards the end of our chat um obviously like nick i'm delighted delighted Mm. that you and uh also became a a patron of mine uh on on my patreon gig and i'm interested i'm always interested to ask people who become my patrons what why did you decide to become a patron what is it about you know what i or this medium is providing that's interested you Okay. Um, well, I think I think it's an example of how we all consume our hobby very differently now to the way we used to 20 years ago, uh, and 25 years ago, whatever. A magazine used to be the only common point of contact when you went to the club and probably any club. People would be saying, "Oh, did you see what Stuart Asquith wrote in Practical Wargamer?" And because we wanted to uh, have as much wargaming in our lives as possible, we would all buy the magazines and we'd all enjoy the same magazines and we'd be reading the same articles and possibly stimulated by the same um, uh, periods that were being produced by um, different companies advertising in there. Now it's much more diverse. Um, I find myself, uh, I really enjoy Wargames magazine still. Um, I, um, however, do find myself listening a lot more to podcasts um, mm-hmm. because I like the diversity of what's what's being said. Mm-hmm. I think you are, you know, able to uh, listen to people talking who've got really serious ideas. Um, I mean, I'm interested to hear what you have to say because you're somebody in the hobby I respect. You're also choosing guests that I'm keen to listen to, apart from Nick, who I listen to far too much. <laughs> Um, but I think it's important when you like something to subscribe to it. One of the reason that magazines go wrong, fail, is that people don't subscribe to them. They cherry pick issues. They pick it up in W. H. Smith's and they go, oh, yeah, I'm interested this month. I'll buy it. Mm. And then when the magazine goes out of business, they go, I'm really, really sick that that magazine went out of business because they used to have some really, really great (laughs) articles in there. The problem is, if you want that magazine to survive and to thrive, you need to accept the fact that there are going to be some months when there ain't everything in there that you want. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the whole thing is effectively one great big smorgasbord, if you like, of articles. Mm -hmm. And you have to view it over the period of the year. Mm -hmm. Has this magazine provided me with enough dishes in the smorgasbord of wargaming Mm -hmm. to make it worth my while committing not just to one edition, but to a whole year's subscription? Mm -hmm. And I find that if you view it like that, and you you recognise the fact that that magazine and now podcasts or whatever are producing things of value, 
you shouldn't expect that to be there every time. You should be supporting that because you want that to remain there and be there in the future when you want to listen to something that is of interest. Mm -hmm. If the magazine is no longer there or the podcast is no longer there, you ain't going to read it, you ain't going to listen to it, and those things of interest will be gone. So that's why I put my hand in my pocket and th threw a few sobs in your direction <laughs> um, once a month, God bless uh, you, as man. you Essex boys would say. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, what you were, your words there are resonating loud and clear with a man who used to run his own magazine. And I can remember you um, back when Battle Games first ran into trouble in, that would have been 20, end of 2011, wasn't it, before Atlantic Publishers bought me out. Um, and I'd made, just literally, I think it was the day after I'd made Made that announcement that oh I'm really sorry guys I think I'm hitting the buffers here. You wrote uh, I can only say it was a beautiful kind of eulogy to to Battle Games magazine saying pretty much what you said there. Um, and you know I I you know I I think I still feel thankful for what you wrote there and it was very moving because it did sum sum up so much of what the problem was that retaining ongoing subscribers in what is obviously a challenging market you know you know i can't I, i'm not stupid obviously uh, doing what i did and launching a magazine into that market at that time just before war games illustrated got a major injection of cash and war game soldiers and strategy <laughs> changed completely was yeah. a challenging thing to do anyway uh, i'd like to think it was brave brave stupid you know that's there's a thin dividing line isn't there um and and, you know, it was a risk, obviously, I accepted, but it was one of the things that I admit that, uh, you know, all these things are a learning process and trying to retain customer loyalty, subscriber loyalty is really hard work. And I've got to tell you, I'm experiencing it again here on Patreon. <laughs> that right. actually uh you know because i set the goals of once i've reached this i'll do this yeah. once i've done, you know and very quickly i established you know uh, i got to sort of what i'm now calling battalion level you know between 750 and a thousand dollars a month but yeah. trying to get beyond that is proving very difficult because the people have come along and subscribed for a while and then for whatever reason and most of the time i have to tell you they don't tell me in the exit poll what that reason is they decide sure. to move on and it's it's quite frustrating when you've got a project and you want to kind of move it forward to the next level uh but you're held back because of that churning of a certain proportion of the subscriber base I, I i you know i have to say and i'm incredibly grateful for there are the vast majority of my subscribers you know 100 odd people have been loyal since the word go yeah. and i seem to be making it clear henry you know just keep chucking stuff at us we'll keep supporting you but it is uh in what is, of course, a new kind of marketplace, Patreon is a new kind of model for doing this mm. kind of thing. No one else in, in our branch of Wargaming has done this before. So yet again, I'm the, sure. I'm the guinea pig. And so I'm discovering these things where, OK, I'd like to take it to the next level. But what is how do I how do I go about that? How do I persuade more people? Obviously, then it becomes should i advertise what i'm doing if i do advertise it where do i advertise it how much is that going to cost how effective yeah. is it going to be how many people are there going to be who might just come along oh i'll try it for a month here's a dollar henry you know i'll try it yeah, for a yeah. month mm, not really he didn't do anything this month that i liked so i'm off again you know as you describe so it's yeah. It's a new and challenging marketplace. So, you know, I'm I'm really grateful, mate, that you and Nick, amongst others, have come on board to help me do what I'm doing. Um, anyway. Well, long may, long may I continue and, you know, best of luck with that because it's uh, – uh, I, I find that when I, I – um, you know, I'm painting and stuff like that, it's brilliant to be able to have things that are hobby-related to listen to. Um, and the, the, the more the merrier, really, in that respect. Yeah. So anyway, um, I just wanted to sort of uh, round up by obvious, asking you the obvious question of, you know, I've seen you on Twitter um, touting palm trees and, 
and jungle yeah. huts and all that kind of stuff and yeah. rubber rubber plantation factories. So something to do with the Far East is the next thing on your agenda, I assume. It is. It's looming large. Uh, don't forget bacon, Uri. <laughs> My solidarity <laughs> movement with uh, vegan, Uri. I, I felt I couldn't go the whole hog and go vegan, so I've gone for a, a bacon diet in January. I'm attempting to eat some bacon product every day throughout January, and we've got a hashtag, hashtag Baconuary going, if people want to get involved with that and show us their rashers, as we say. As you say, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, on the wargaming front, I am uh, uh, in the process of um, – going far eastern with uh, my chain of command um, rules because we're heavily involved in playtesting uh, the rules for the far east there. The guys down in Australia in the chain of command Australia group have got a big uh, far east convention thing coming up at CanCon this month. Oh, right. Um, <clears throat> and Len Tracy, who was the former commanding officer of the Australian Army Jungle Warfare School, uh, helped, um, well, didn't help, but did put together the... Uh, you know, rules, rule amendments and suggestions there. And Len and I are working together, uh, very much led by Len, to get uh, uh, army lists together for all the different areas of the Far East and get some theatre-specific rules together. And I'm in the process of – I've got my Japanese on the painting table now. I'm going to be using my eighth army figures um, because the first thing I'm kicking off with is Hong Kong and Singapore oh, wow. um, in 1941. And then I'm going to be obviously playtesting my way through the whole thing. Nick is painting up mm -hmm. some uh, U.S. Marines. I've also bought some Australians. Uh, I've got some uh, an army, 14th Army uh, Brits to paint up um, and some all sorts of different indigenous uh, tribesmen who are fighting alongside the different sides. I want to do... Uh, um, some of the uh, uh, Indian INA troops uh, mm -hmm. fighting alongside the Japanese, so and the Dutch, of course, the Dutch East Indies. So that's uh, uh, it's been an interesting one because um, normally when you when you go right, we're going to do Normandy next. You can go well. I've got those buildings from the First World War; they're perfectly good for the Second World yeah, War. Yeah, and perfectly yeah. good. But when you haven't got a jungle, um, you have to get cracking. So I've been I've been making huge amounts of jungle and banana plantations and uh, uh, huts and uh, administration buildings for um, um, all sorts of all sorts of people railway lines and bits and pieces rusty old metal bridges over gorges so that's that's been fun and I am and literally presumably, presumably yeah. creatively challenging as well because it's not the kind of terrain that normal you'd make for a, a run-of-the-mill war game it's it's different no, no, stuff it's from very different. yeah very different it's it's been uh it's been an homage to uh to fish tank uh foliage <laughs> uh, <laughs> um i mean i honestly do wonder whether these aquarium plants are ever used in an aquarium setting i am actually convinced that they're all bought by war gamers all over the world <laughs> Because whenever you look online, you type in Wargaming Jungle, it's all aquarium plants. I yeah. actually don't believe anybody keeps fish in fish tanks. <laughs> it's simply Wargamers buying them all up. And um, that, that's been good fun to build. But my God, you need a lot of jungle to cover a six yeah. by four table. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we're nearly there, nearly there. I'm, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm painting my Japanese up and really looking forward to getting them on the table. I've got a kind of, um, I've always had a bit of a mental block about the Japanese because my uh, uncle was uh, mm. a prisoner of war and um, consequently it's a case with, you know, real life family mm. sort of issues coming into contact with wargaming issues. But um, I have, uh, that's, that's a, a hurdle that I feel that I've overcome in as much as I'm, doing the research and doing the, the reading uh, as, as you know, an analytic historian mm. rather than somebody who's going, core, I eliminate these individuals chopping mm. people's heads off, whatever. But you, you have to get beyond that and try and study it. And they are actually a really interesting army mm. uh, and structured in quite different ways and with very specific national characteristics. So I'm really looking forward to getting that on the table. I'm hoping if I work like a, a ferocious little elf, I can have them on the table at uh, at the club next Tuesday. Wow! Um, 
but um, but I might go out and drink a lot of beer instead and leave. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of uh, I feel a I feel a battery recharge coming on, and uh, uh, yeah. and that may be necessary. A man can only <laughs> take so many banana plantations. Which yeah, you're not wrong. Mate. You're not wrong. It's I have happened. another box of banana trees just arrived yesterday, and I look at them and I think, do I really want to do another box of these? But but, but it does fit perfectly with veganry. What can I say? <laughs> I don't eat them. <laughs> I should drape bacon on them. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff them with a sausage. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's interesting that you're going Far East because, again, I suppose a bit like World War One, or maybe certain actions with lots of SS yeah. present and that kind of stuff, there's a certain kind of ooh, frisson, yeah. shall we say, about yeah. uh, the, that theatre of war. And, of course, yeah. also that those early actions you mentioned, mm. Singapore and all that, weren't exactly the most glorious era for the British Army me either uh oh. for a lot of it <clears throat> but of course then you've got later periods with the chindits and stuff like yeah, that that's right and yeah. of course the the challenge much as the same as in vietnam you know jungle terrain fighting in close terrain and that kind of stuff uh incredible tactical challenges and also gaming challenges playing a game with so many bloody bushes and trees on the table uh, I, I really like the idea that the game will be a learning experience for the uh Commonwealth British and US players when we go down that route yeah. which will mirror the experience that they had in reality yeah. recognising the fact that the jungle is not the the friend of their opponent the jungle is neutral yeah. as somebody once said yeah. and in fact Amazon have just told me that book has just come through my door letterbox while we've been speaking oh really it. wow yeah um, so um, yeah, the, the only issue is that it's mean we're just having a new unit built here on Lard Island because I'm amassing so many books for research. <laughs> We've uh, what was the um, workshop and um, uh, and stock building is now being entirely taken over with stock. So we've got a new workshop and uh, library building going. Uh, really? With, yeah, the slabs going down for that today. Wow. So. Um, it's uh, we're, it, we're ever expanding. I think the island may be um, sinking under the weight <laughs> of, uh, of historical tomes. Like Tracy <laughs> Island, you need a, a Thunderbird to, to, you know, running out of space. Looking behind me here, Rich, you can probably oh, see. Yeah. I'm just. This yeah. is supposed to be my design work surface, and yeah. I just I can't stop buying bloody books. It's just a disease. Yeah. What can I say? Hello. And we've been it joined is, by the a... cat now, which is a yeah. sign that it's probably time for me to wrap up, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> the cat stuff. We have been chatting for a little more than two hours by the looks of things. Mate, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. And I'm sure that the listeners have learned a lot today about you and about the Lardies, for which I thank you. Uh, but also, mate, because you're just brilliant company. Thanks so much yeah. for coming on. Yeah, nice to nice to chat, Henry, as always. Brilliant. All right, then, Rich, I'll see you probably at a show sometime soon. I'm sure we all soon uh, will. And if we can't see you, we'll probably hear you first. <laughs> Some distance away, usually, yeah. Assuming you've still got a voice. So thanks ever so much, Rich. That's brilliant. Cheers. Thanks, Henry.